just discovered one very important uh, important thing. That is, if you don't sleep in the evening, last night, then you will be very sleepy today. <laughs> Do you know that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> did you sleep in that last night? Yes. I did. <laughs> but it's okay. And today I went to the sea. What do you mean, oh? <laughs> huh? You don't know there's a beach around here? Did you go to the beach sometime? Huh? It's really? <laughs> Too cold, huh? Yes. Yes. I saw a lot of people swim, you know that, today. So cold, I don't know how they do it. Well, I did it in the Himalaya before, <laughs> but I never do it again. You know, in the Himalaya, it's the Gang, Ganges River, and the most, uh, you know, sacred river of the Indian people. And uh, it uh, begins uh, in the Himalaya, very high mountain, the place where the, Gang the Ganges River first originated. Originates, it's called uh, Gango Tree, means the source of the Ganges River. And I went there, and the water just flow directly from the ice. You don't see any more river, just just water running from the icy cold mountain. And that's where the water came from first. And then you can bathe in there. A lot of people go there to take a bath no? in summer. And then they leave with the clean that's in it. I told you already, did I not? Yeah? No? Jesus. You have bad memories. <laughs> Which is good for me. Uh, when I run out of uh, stories, I can just uh, Repeat the old one. <laughs> you don't know the difference. Okay, so thousand, oh no, millions, millions of people go there every year. Some of them die in between, before and after. <laughs> but still, people like to go there to clean their sin. And normally, they come there and just splash some water on their face because the water is so cold. It just came from the eyes, you know, just a little bit, like zero, zero degree, and the water just flowing eyes. Because the sun of the summer, you know, melt the, the top of the snow, the top layer of the snow and of the ice, so the water will run down there, and that is how the Ganges begin. You know, people go there and splash their water on the face, you know, or hand or thing like that. Of their feet, so that they begin, they, they, they believe this, their sins is clean. And I went there and did exactly the same. But then I thought, oh, then only my face and my hand are cleaned of the sin. <laughs> How about the rest of my body? <laughs> uh, that, that won't do. So I jump in. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I jump in all, I don't have to count the five. One, two, three, four, five. Then I have to jump out. Because then you're, you're, if you don't jump out after five, you never jump out again. <laughs> and you will float out, you know? <laughs> to the plane, like this. <laughs> and become one of the many. <laughs> and because in, the, in India, after people die, they uh, don't bury, no? Mostly they will burn the, the corpse, huh? Or they just throw it in the Ganges River. First they burn it and throw the ashes in the river, any river, because the Ganges has many, many branches too. Hmm? And uh, there are three of the source of the Ganges. One is Yamna tree, the other is Gango tree, the other is... Uh, what tree, tree? Oh, never mind. Another tree somewhere. <laughs> I forgot the name. And mostly people in India, after they die, 
No, not after they die, but after somebody die, the living <laughs> will burn them. Uh, the 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 one who has money, their bodies will be burned by their relatives and friends until we came ashes and then they put into an urn, you know, box like this, and then they went to the water, big water like Ganges River, and throw it in. But some people don't have enough money, so they just throw it in, you know. <laughs> and then after a while it becomes swollen and white, you know, it looked like a foreigner, you know. <laughs> Yeah, originally it's black and small, you know, like Indian, but after three days it's become like an American. Yeah. <laughs> really fat, big, white, all swollen. So sometimes if you walk along too, too long, you know, along the Ganges River, because there are many roads along the Ganges River, and you walk too long and you're tired and you don't know where to rest, you just lay near the Ganges River, not too near, in water, they will rise up in the night, you know. And then take some of the body, you know, this still intact body and swollen and soft and white, you know, and make it a pillow. <laughs> it's very soft. <laughs> you try. I... <laughs> no, I don't tell lies. You try. Or you can meditate on it, you know. Well, so when you go to India, there's no need cushion so clumsy like you. Just go to Ganges, you know, <laughs> the riverside, and pick any of your size or bigger size. Then just sit on it, it's pretty soft. Soft and just, you know, spongy. <laughs> and then uh, when you sit in such a cup, you feel in samadhi, I guarantee. Because you're too frightened to move. <laughs> just stiff like this. Yeah. A lot of yogis, they, they do that. Nobody is afraid of death in India. They, they will laugh at you if you're scared of uh, death, no? But for them, die, to die is liberation. You just go from somewhere else, it's better, and you take a rest. And if you want to come back to this world again, or if it is your destiny or your mission to come back, you will just come back. Yeah. No problem. And it is so. Of course, there's some, some, some places unpleasant, but most people go to pleasant places like astral, astral paradise and then come back again. No? And when you die, the body has no, no more problem. It won't cause any problem to anybody else. The corpse is just dead, discarded kind of material. So nobody is ever afraid of death at all. You know that? No, you don't? Okay, go to India, get a cup, sit on it and ask it. <laughs> Should I be afraid of you? He said, mm mm. <laughs> and then you run. <laughs> yeah, it looks very uh, bad sometimes if, if you happen to see some cups which is half uh, decomposed and half is still there, or half is eaten by dogs or. Vultures, you know, and half is still hanging around there. Yeah, then it's very, it looks very ugly, huh? But when the corpse is still complete, you know, and fat and white and puffy, you know, it make a good pillow and meditation cushion. You can try. I guarantee satisfaction, money back. <laughs> Uh, the rumor, rumor has it that because of so many, uh, like the composed body in the Ganges water, that's why the water is so pure. Yuck! <laughs> <laughs> they say the calcium, you know, from those rotten bones or something, purify the water. So actually, there's so much garbage and trash and. A yucky thing go into the Ganges River, <laughs> but the water is really pure. You can put it in a jar for ten years, it won't go rotten. There's, and it's, it just as it is, you know. They don't have like purified system in India, and they don't have a filter to make sure 
the water is clean even. No, they just drink like that, straight. Some people use uh, cloth huh, to filter, but some people don't. And sometimes some uh, uh, lep leprosy, the sick people, huh? Leprosy sickness, leprosy kind of uh, center, you know, situated next to the Ganges River Bank, you know, on top of yours, you know, on top of your river uh, as a section. And people still go to the river there. <laughs> And in India, sometimes they don't have a sanitary system like bathroom, toilet, and all that. So everything just very freely <laughs> go anywhere. <laughs> and sometimes you happen to encounter, you know, yesterday chapatis on the road, you know, <laughs> or milk, you know, under your feet, but in different form and different smell, of course, <laughs> because it's been two, three days old already. Has been go through some filter system. So you just have to put up with it. Sometimes, you know, you, you think of Himalaya or, how you say, uh, Indian and some riverside as a very romantic, mysterious place to go, to sit for meditation. But when I went there the last of very last time, it was terrible. It was summer. And I went to the top of the Himalaya, you know, you know where the source of uh, mysterious story like Babaji, Yogananda, uh, you know, teacher and all that came from. And I, I was dying to find a river spot, you know, riverside spot to sit and meditate, you know, as is described in the book. You know, <laughs> you have to do everything according to the book. It sounds so romantic, you know, the yogi sit next to the river, you know, uh, on the bank of the river and all that, and f forget everything, you know, <laughs> just be in blissful reunion with God. Oh, God, I try hard. <laughs> because everywhere is, you know, three, four days old chapatis, <laughs> and the smell is also awful, you know, just like three days old. <laughs> it's just terrible, you can't even find a place to sit next to the the water anymore. And that was the, one of the holiest place in India and in the Himalaya. Because so many people go there every year, and that's why I become a little bit unholy. <laughs> Everything so polluted and smells so bad. The nearer the holy place, you know, the more messy. So sometimes the illusion and the reality don't match. We imagine a lot of things. For example, in Tibet also, you heard about so many big monasteries, huh? Where all the holy monks, like thousands or sometimes ten thousands of them, reside there, study together, you know, and uh, it's a pretty impressive sight. But next to the monastery, you know, on the empty spot, you know, empty yard behind the monastery, sometime in the morning, thousands of them you know, sit there, do the same business <laughs> in the open. They don't have any other system. They just let the nature take care of nature, you know. So that's the way it is. And sometimes, if you're not used to it, <laughs> you can feel very. <coughs> <laughs> When I was in India, you know, I'm a very shy person, huh? Everybody is, you know, when it comes to that. <laughs> but you just have to put up with it. So I have to go everywhere. I, I wear a big rope, you know. I know now why the Indian people wear rope instead of trousers. <laughs> not, not mini jeep, huh? No, rope, you know, like sarong, rub around. Large and airy, and, you know, very convenient. When you sit, it just flow around. <laughs> just, you know, protective, you know. <laughs> just form of protection all around you, like an umbrella. Yeah? And to make sure, I had another umbrella on top. <laughs> so I have roof and walls. <laughs> and then you're convenient everywhere. 
<laughs> Otherwise, sometimes the bus just stops right on the middle of nowhere, and behind the bus is a high mountain you can't climb as stiff as the wall. No? And in front of you is a cliff just, just as, also as stiff as the wall too. So you can both become cliffhanger there or cliffhanger here. So you just have no choice but do it right there. <laughs> So the salon, you know, and the umbrella is pretty helpful. In case you want to go to India to find a holy master or something, don't forget these two stuff. Huh? And uh, sleeping bag, of course. Anyhow, and sometimes you have to, to be quick. You know, these are some practical tips I have to give you. <laughs> I'm sorry if you don't like it. You have to be quick. Because sometimes you can only do it at night. In daytime, you're too shy, you know. Too many people, thousands of them look on all the time. <laughs> they don't know what privacy means, okay? And also, there are a lot of wow animals here. <laughs> <clears throat> and when... <laughs> so the uh, rope is convenient, you know? Because if you sit down, you can always jump up and run again. <laughs> if you wear trousers, it's very difficult. <laughs> By the time you zip it up, you know, the animal will come up to you. <laughs> because well, sometimes uh, you just you should prepare to sit and come. <laughs> Somebody wants to say hello <laughs> in a very Himalayan language, you know. Even though you don't understand that language, I advise you, don't stay there. Don't say hello back, just run. <laughs> yes, so sometimes there are a lot of things that you don't know about the Himalaya. And sometimes a big snake, you know, as big as your body, cobra, you know, like rattlesnake, <laughs> some what? And uh, I say, wear glasses, snake, and all that. Oh, they look pretty. Impressive when they rise ahead at you and say hello. <laughs> Hi there. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you should return <laughs> the greeting. Either you stay still or you run fast. Mm. Well, it's not all that bad. In my house, there's only scorpions and, uh, and centipedes. Snow snakes, snakes stay outside. Yeah, but the scorpions, they are funny, you know? Maybe it's too cold or maybe they are lazy, they don't bite you. Why? Did they didn't bite me, but they did bite some neighbor. <laughs> I think my neighbor's scorpions are more diligent <laughs> than, than mine, because mine never beat me. One time I sleep... Oh, this is another story. Uh, later, later, okay. <clears throat> okay, so my scorpions is, uh, you know, they sleep with me. They sleep under the the couch, huh? Not that I really have a couch, it's just a very rotten kind of four leg kind of uh I'll say they uh they get some kind of uh um no what's called some 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 Okay, make a yay rin, you know it's how huh? Rotten my I think I'm not in Ah, the, those the rope were made in the from the bark of the trees and all that. Then they uh, knit them together, and then uh, hang them on on the four poles, you know, like that. And it's just like a hang mat. Hang mat. And you throw your sleeping bag on it, zip it up, and sleep. And then meanwhile, you can see uh, through. Not that I have magical power, but I can see through the walls and the roof. A lot, thousand of holes in everywhere. I call them five thousand star hotel, <laughs> <laughs> and it's pretty cheap, yeah. And then the scorpion, of course, like to wander around, you know, through the halls, through the roof, and then sometimes drop on top of my sleeping bag and just stay there. And then in the morning, when I woke up and say, "Ooh, what is that?" <laughs> and he raised his head and say, "It's me." <laughs> it's me, Scorpio. <laughs> so I have to take, you know, one or two of them 
under the pillow or the blanket or under the table or under the chair or under the bed, huh? sometimes a lot, maybe ten of them, and centipedes, you know, and take them together, put them in a jar, and then go out for a walk. And then find some big rock and take that, let, let them take refuge. The next day, others come again. <laughs> ah, every day I'm busy. <laughs> take care of these sentient beings. Mm. But there was fun because there's nothing much to do. There was, uh, in, uh, there was in one of the houses, the mud houses that I stay, why they call mud houses, because they use mud to make the wall. You know, they just simple, you know, tie some, uh, pop some uh, piece of wood or something together and then they put, uh, you know, cow shit and uh, <laughs> yeah, really, <laughs> I'm not kidding you. <laughs> That's the, what they use. Or else what you call that? Huh? Men? Men. <laughs> Do you think when we say that, the things will <laughs> change the quality or something? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, not couch, it may be bullshit. <laughs> and then mix them with... They mix them with uh, some kind of grass, you know, and then just pat it on the wall, pass it on the wall, and when it dry, that's what it is. And of course, you know, when it dry, there are a lot of holes will appear, you know, because it's never enough. And of course, you can fix them by go out and find some more bullshit and fix it up <laughs> when you live there, or you don't care about all this bullshit anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's that's thing. Uh, that's one of those houses I live. Most of the house in Himalaya like that. If you even have a house, and sometimes they also rent a veranda to you, like that kind of house already occupied. So outside of the house there is a kemahing veranda, huh? Huh? Garage. Garage? They don't even have any garage. <laughs> Huh? Veranda, huh? Can I hear you? Okay. You can rent the veranda as well, it's cheaper. And you take your, uh, you put your belonging in a corner and you hang your mosquito net there, and that's where your house is. <coughs> if you don't have a mosquito nest, you can, you can rent. <coughs> they will also rent you blanket mosquito net, you know, and a warm stove and coal you can buy. And then you can cook something for yourself. But it's not much, huh? Mostly there I just eat raw. <laughs> it's too much to carry a lot of uh, utensils around. And when you climb very high, you can't afford. There's no car, no garage, <laughs> no train, uh, no... F- Motorcycle. I don't never see any motorcycle climb the mountain yet, but there may be in the future. And not even bicycle. The only bus you can take is number 11. <laughs> and it goes pretty slow. <laughs> Especially uphill. Huh? And when you carry your sleeping bag and chapati flour and, you know, Kang bay, kang bay, you know, cup, steel cup, a spoon, whatever. Everything very heavy. So the long, the 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 higher you go, the more stuff you throw away. <laughs> when I started my journey, I took a lot of things. You know, oh, I would need that. I would need this. I would need this umbrella, a three, four spoon, uh, two chopstick for different size. You know, and two cups and two dishes and all stainless steel. You know, and all that. And books even. You know, and map. Yeah, and uh, binoculars and uh, binoculars and glasses and everything. Wow, complete, you know, like a real explorer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but every step I go, I have to drop one thing. Wow, you had no idea how heavy the sleeping bag even can become. When it's damp, you know, and raining a little, snowing a little, and the sleeping bag just suck in all this and it became heavier and heavier, and my feet also became heavier because it's a sports shoe that I wear. 
I have not been in Himalaya before. I thought sports shoe would do. But sports shoe, you know, all the water came inside. And the snow also sneaked in for take, because it's warmer there, you know. <laughs> and I take refuge in my shoes. And then after I walk for many, many miles, the feet became very big and heavy as well, you know. And you walk like this. Uh, when you when you have a place to rest, then you have to take all your shoes out, wring your socks, and hang it on some stove somewhere, or wash them, and then wear them again next morning. But most of the time, they don't have time to dry so fast. They don't have hair dry, uh, no, you know, dryer in the Himalaya, and uh, and in the morning sometimes we have to go very early to go together with the group, huh? Yeah, and so you have to hurriedly. So, so most of the time I wear also damp clothes, very damp. I have only two pairs of clothes, so I get one wash and one wear. But sometimes both of them look like washed because it's all in the rain, you know. <laughs> so I have a choice either to wear that one, you know, soak it in the rain, or to wear the other one was soaked in the stream water. <laughs> it's both the same. Sometimes they don't have time to dry. So, but after you walk for a while, you know, it dry by wind and air and your temperature body. It can, it can dry because if you walk, your temperature rise up. You became hot, and most of the times I walk. Sometimes in the very rare region, they have horses for rent, and they have a, they call a laborer who carry you behind in the back or four laborer to ca- carry a seat and chair kind, and you sit in the middle. But be careful, huh, because it's very slippery. Sometimes they throw the pe- <laughs> the customer, you know, down. <laughs> and both of them also, uh, four of them also crawling, you know, and they five crawl together, <laughs> and and the chair became pieces, you know. It's very dangerous sometimes. That's why people don't often go there. And if they go there and they became, they came back in one piece, they think they're very lucky. Yeah. Sometimes one piece is in the Himalaya, another piece flow down the uh, ocean, and another piece hang on the tree somewhere. Yeah, because it's dangerous. If you just uh, walk, not carefully, and slip, you know, one step, and you became like sometime, you know, dust, because so high, you become for well, different pieces. Mm. A lot of people die every year going on pilgrim. Okay, let's go back to the Scorpion stuff. <laughs> Another time when I stay also in near the Himalaya, another place called Rishikesh, they also rent this kind of mud houses. Uh, and uh, because the house inside is stuffy, you know, they don't make a very big deal, like big window with screen, screen door and all that. So most of the time I climb up the roof and sleep. Yeah. And uh, after a while, many other people, neighbor, you know, the pilgrims like me, or sometimes Westerner, they go there and meditate because there are a lot, a lot of ashram around there. You know, one of the uh, master, very famous, this master from the Beatles, you know, transcendental meditation, yogis. He, he's one. Uh, I say originate from there too. That place called Rishikesh. A lot of master went there in different times to meditate. I also stay there for two months and meditate sometimes. And so I went to the roof to sleep. And you know, most often the scorpion come up to the roof like me, do yoga exercise, and then meditate like big deal, and then <laughs> <laughs> and in the morning get up, you know, with the sun exercise and meditate for a while and then go down. But we don't have a staircase, eh? you have to kind of climb the wall with your nails. <laughs> because the wall is mud anyhow, and there's some hole in there, you put your toe in there or you put your finger in there, and then you just find your way up. Mm, it's okay. I always found my way up. Mm. Oh, okay. Um, okay, now let's go to the stop. Did I tell you about my husband? My ex-husband, when he went there and met me? Oh, really? 
Okay, okay, okay. Okay, hang on, hang on. <laughs> Don't be too excited and make trouble for me. I forget. <laughs> What was it that I said? <laughs> oh, forget it, huh? Forget it. <laughs> okay, okay. Okay, at that time when I was in that place called Rishikesh, oh, did I tell you the neighbor was beaten black and blue? No, okay, next to me, okay, let's, let's go fast because it's painful. <laughs> oh, she was beaten, so swollen everywhere. And I had to go to the hospital. It was so poisonous, but they didn't bite me. But I found one, you know, next to my pillow in the morning. Mm. He, just, he just lay there like dead. <laughs> And I say, hi there, are you alive or dead? And he, he moves his uh, whisker, you know, to let me know, don't, don't touch me. <laughs> I said, no, oh, no, 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 I just say hello, okay. <laughs> And then, okay, so that's the place. Huh? Okay, so I just tell you the story. And then at that time, I was about maybe a year or something already in the Himalaya. Hmm? I didn't see my ex-husband then, the doctor. Huh? I just call the doctor better husband. What for? I hate. <laughs> Sound like a housewife. <laughs> okay. So what happened is I stayed there for a while, and then my so-called husband, huh? ex, or oh, last, or <laughs> never seen again. <laughs> he went. He went there to meet me, but he didn't know I was there. I also didn't know he was coming. I was in Delhi before and in other regions and stay in different ashram, you know, with different masters and different groups and just to learn here and there and checking out everything. And then I was tired of all the groups and the ashram politics. So I went alone. I went to different places to meditate. And uh, Rishikesh was not the first place and it's not the only place. But this is place where things take place. <laughs> so, and then I stayed there for two months. And then my ex-husband, he had holiday or something, or he missed me somehow. He went to India to want to find me, and he went to Delhi, the ashram that he knew that I was there before. So he went there, but he didn't find me. So he hang around. Nobody know where I went. He hang around and tried to find somebody who knows me. So anyhow. Uh, they, and meanwhile, he was miserable, and they tried to tell him that, ah, you should not worry about your wife, you should worry about your soul, you know. Uh. <clears throat> What's that? So, and at that time, he already knew that I was in Rishikesh, yeah? so he said to the, ah, my soul is in Rishikesh. <laughs> so the next day, he packed, you know, and He just have a knapsack, you know, back, 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 backpack. Yeah, and then he went there to see me. But say, talk about Rishikesh, it's also big, you know. It's not just like our meditation center here. It's a, it's a city, you know, a small city. So many ashrams, so many things going on, so many people all the time. But he went to my room and found me. Uh, actually, I wasn't in my room. I was on top of um, another mountain <laughs> where there was a spring water coming out, and I was washing my clothes yeah, and taking a morning bath. Sometimes I go to the Ganges River and take bath there, but sometimes I took bath uh, next to the stream near my home, my, my rented room. <laughs> Okay, but that was uh, a another story took place before that. Okay. Uh, meanwhile, before my ex-husband came, huh, there was another friend who came. And actually, it's not a real friend. I, I don't really have any friend. When I stay in one ashram in Delhi, he was there too, and uh, he was kind of famous because he's Canadian Chinese the one and only <laughs> in the group of Indian or Western people. And I'm also one and only kind of Asia face over there. So he and I were both very famous. 
Mm. I was famous because I worked for the ashram and they named me Smiling Step because they say every step I go, I smile. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, I never saw if I smile or not. I didn't possess a mirror there. But I was very beloved. And sometimes people even bow to me, you know. They prostrate in front of me and I scared. I was so scared. Those with long beard and big turban, you know, about 70 years old, they were fit enough to be my grandmaster. <laughs> yeah, sometimes they just prostrate to me. I don't understand anything. Anyhow, that was uh, by the way. Okay? And he was famous there, and I also knew him because he, he, he brought there with the uh, trend like survival into 24 centuries, you know, things like that, with the raw food, you know, sprouts and uh, wheat germs, whatever that is. So everybody uh, in that ashram, because they also bore, have nothing to do, they follow him. And he was a kind of, you know, survival guru. You know? <laughs> and then we grow wheat germs on top of our ta- bath tower and grow sprout in, in front of our, you know, uh, window and or on top of on top of our washing sink, thing like that. So he was famous for a while. Nah? And when I was there uh, for a while, he went there also. Uh, he um, went there and then he somehow found me. And he saw me, huh? And then uh, he asked me, oh, this is a nice room. Actually, very cheap, just a mud house, you know, square like this, a top, and no window, no door. You know? <laughs> well, you can have a door, but, you know, look like no door at all. Quack, 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 like that, a big piece of wood, and then you have to push with all your might. And then when you open it, bang, sometimes it bang on your head. You know? <laughs> it's very difficult. So he likes it, because in such a places, you know, to find a private room like that is heaven. You can stay in any ashram there if you want, free of charge, but you can only stay three days in each. That's the rule. Because they don't want you to stay there forever and bring all the lies and laws and, you know, <laughs> raise them there and be attached to the ashram. So. They're very hospitable, but three days only, and then you move. And then you keep moving all the time, it's very tiring. So he got a room like that, and then he, w- he was very interested. He asked me whether he can rent one himself. I said, oh, not at the moment, not that I know of, but three more days, you have one next door to me. Huh? So if you want to wait, and you can, or you can come back again. He said, oh, I don't have anywhere to go, I don't know how to go around here. The first day, I said, okay, then stay here, in my room. Huh? I don't sleep here anyhow. I sleep on the roof every day and you go... <laughs> and so you sleep here, you know? Actually, in the ashram before, we sometimes sleep together, and not in one bed, no ma, in one room. Yeah, sometimes ashram, they make very big room, you know? And then you sleep just like in Meoli, you know? Like sardine in the doors, in, in the box, yeah? Like fish in the boxes. It's okay, no problem. We don't mind. Huh? So anyhow, we already knew each other and I think no, I didn't share room with him, but sometimes we sleep outside together, a lot of people together, you know. Or we went away with the teacher, huh? then we just have to sleep anywhere that there is a corner to, to lay your head on. Or sometimes you cannot. Like sometimes six months on stretch, I have to sit. I don't have a, a place to even lay down. So I have a chair, like folding chair like you, like uh, on the beach chair, nah? I take it with me, and one of a small suitcase. So in the evening, I just open it and sit on the chair and put my leg on my suitcase. And uh, how I sleep for s- six months. And in the daytime, sometimes I fold it, you know, sometimes I don't. Fold it is better. Now I, I stay in a corner. You know, like on the roof of any house, they sometimes build a little bit extra higher wall on the roof, huh? And then the corner is like this, huh? So I sit in one corner and I put my blanket on top of that corner and that's where my house was <laughs> every day. It's just pretty hot there, you know. In summer it can be 40 degrees Celsius. But I have no place to go because some, sometimes the ashram is overflow with people and I don't like to stay together with people too much, you know, because they make noise, they snore, and they have diarrhea, and they s- sometimes smoke pot, everything. So I prefer to stay alone, you know, even one corner alone is better than together with hundreds of others. It's okay, I stay there. In the daytime I cover with the blanket, in the nighttime I just sleep under the stars. 
and sitting, you know, very, very simple. So when it rains, I don't have much to even move. I just take the chair and the luggage, poop, go into under the veranda roof. Okay. So now, where were we? Oh, Jesus. Why I go so far like that? Huh? Yeah, then when I go over. Uh, huh? <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Yes, because we sometimes sleep together outside, you know, things like that. Or maybe he sleeps next door in another corner in the night, but I sleep all day and all night there. You know, it's my quarter. Because I don't have anywhere else to move my stuff inside the house. Everywhere, the cool place, the safe place are all occupied. Even on the floor, everywhere. You know, sometimes like in Meoli, huh? Or anywhere that you go, like a hotel, and then you sleep on the floor, every corner you occupy. So that's the place where I put my stuff all day, all night, for six months. And then, uh, so it's okay, we don't, we don't mind, you know, man, woman at that time. I don't even think. Just okay, just a friend. So it's okay, stay here in my room. You know, you can put your stuff here and sleep in this bed. I sleep on the roof. Anyhow, in the daytime, I'm. Almost not here because I go out to the Ganges River, swim, take a bath, wash my clothes there, and then put them on the rock to dry. Meanwhile, I hide myself in some of the cave, you know, on the Ganges River side and then meditate. And then a few hours later, my clothes dry, and I put them back on again, and then I go out shopping. <laughs> Buy some exciting thing like chapatis and peanut butters. Yeah. <laughs> And cucumber, yeah? Most of my meal are like that. Or else I buy flour and make chapati myself in the evening. In the evening I make it myself. This is very simple. You buy flour, some salt in it, huh? And then you just have a plate, you know, aluminium plate or dish, you know, a little bit, a little bit high like this, so you can even cook soup and tea in it, and you can make chapati on top of it. Uh, so I just uh, roll the flour together, you know, the way I teach you. <laughs> and then put on that, and then turn over, and then eat with peanut butter. Mm? That's very nice. <laughs> mm. <laughs> <laughs> I live a very simple life, because at that time I didn't have much money. I didn't ask for my ex-husband, and I didn't want to borrow from anybody. I just stretch, you know, my money as much as possible. Mm. Very simple life. So I said to him, you can use my room until you have next room. Huh? I don't sleep here, and daytime I'm, em I'm gone, and nighttime I sleep on the roof. But it doesn't matter if I sleep together with him, because he probably, you know, the room, we sleep here, he sleep there. We did that sometimes. <clears throat> so, okay, he put his stuff there, very grateful, and then go around, go somewhere else. And in the evening, uh, he came back and sleep on top of the roof also with me. <laughs> and meanwhile, he found his girlfriend, or I don't know, or the girlfriend just found him, or any girlfriend, I don't know. And then they nestled together next to me, and that's okay with me, all right. And then the next morning, probably my ex-husband came, okay? It's also okay with me, yeah, it's okay with me. But then uh, he found me, and then uh, he wanted to speak to me, and he wanted to take me around, and he wanted me to be with him, blah, blah, blah. It's okay with me too. But I said to him, well, this is the last day of my seven days retreat in the middle of the Ganges River. So would you please wait for me until the evening and I come back? Huh? Because uh, in the middle of the Ganges River over there, there is a uh, place that's just like an island. But in the daytime you don't see it because the water will cover it. Or cover near, nearly, you can't have access to it. You can, uh, uh, at night time, cannot go. A daytime you can go. You go when the sun rises and you come back when the sun sets. Then the water is still not so high, you still can see the rock, and you can walk over back to your home. But if it's a little later, the water will be too high, you can't walk. And there's no even boat to <laughs> bring you from that small island in the middle back to the river bank. So I went there every day to meditate, because there was a very uh, famous master who lived uh, in that, uh, you know, opposite the bank, you know, next to the island. Yeah? And he told me I should go there and meditate in that cave for seven days, and then uh, you'll feel good. You know, he told me, I said, okay, why not? <laughs> I have nothing else to do. 
because his disciples always go there and do retreat in the daytime. At nighttime she has to come back because it's dangerous to stay there. Sometimes the water comes very high and covers the caves. You know, you can't stay there. So I went there every day and meditate. And that was the last day of my seven-day retreat that I promised the teacher. And then, uh, then my, when my husband came, so I said, okay, stay here, wait, huh? I come back. I tell him I come back about six o'clock in the evening. Go five o'clock, the sun set, and I walk out, and then uh, I walk around, and then uh, where's the, there is a boat to take me back to the other side, and I walk for a while, and then about six o'clock, fine, huh? But that day, ah, I couldn't go by boat. There was so much uh, wind and rain, you know, the Ganges water became like an ocean, so much waves, so no boats coming. So I wait for one, I know it's no boat, so I had to turn around and walk many miles upstream where there will be a bridge, you know, a hanging bridge, and then I can cross over there and then run back <laughs> along the side of the riverside and go back to my mountain up there. So that takes longer time. It's about seven o'clock or more when I reach my place. But my husband already gone. Yeah. And they told me, just left. Hmm. And I don't know what's going on. So I found my friend. Oh, so scary. I found my friend, you know, the, the, the raw food survival into 24th century. So I say, where is my husband? You know? At that time, he was still my husband, so it's okay. He said, oh, he just gone. He said, how he gone? I told him to wait for me here. He said, I don't know. He's just gone. And he said, what's this? Because I recognized it was a movie camera that was belonged to me before I left him. It was given to me by my uh, fiancé, you know, the other one, that I did not marry. <laughs> also, not the doctor. It's a long story. Forget it. <laughs> I was chased by a couple of doctors, so, but forget it. Just the main one, enough for you. <laughs> Anyhow, that one is very rich, you know, the one that I did not marry. Very, very rich. Ooh. <laughs> he had a big box full of jewelry, you know, and thick. He said, that belonged to you. Now I have even more. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's another story, okay? Okay. My, my, my ex-husband are not rich, huh? Just, okay, average doctor, but the other one was richer, the one I didn't want to marry. He managed to engage, but that's it, <laughs> no more. And what was now? Okay, and then I said, what was that? He said, oh, he gave me this uh, movie's camera. I said, why he gave you this camera? It used to belong to me. He didn't say anything, just left. I said, no, he just gave me the camera. I said, now it belongs to you, and he just left. I said, it's funny. It's really funny. Is there anything else you say to him? He say, no, not really, we just talk, talk, and then your husband asks me, where do I stay? I say, I stay here. <laughs> in your room. <laughs> and sleep in your bed. <laughs> I say, oh, that's it, that's it. Oh, I was so mad at him. I say, why are you so stupid? He say, why? It's the truth. <laughs> Of course, but the truth is not true, huh? It sounds as if I live with him and we sleep together. And that's why my husband left, I guess, huh? I guess. That's why he, he threw that camera to him and I left, because that belonged to me. He probably bring it to me, you know, for me. But then he thought, because now I live with that guy together, so that camera belonged to him too, because I belong to him. <laughs> oh, okay, oh my God. I said, no, 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 this is, uh, this is bad, you know? And, and he was, I was so kind of mad and kind of uh, panicked, and, and the guy didn't know anything. He said, oh, she changed. It's strange. <laughs> and then I, I run, you know? I run after him. I run to the, uh, the bus stop, find him, but then he's gone. When I arrived, he just gone a few minutes ago. Just like he left and I come, just like the movies, you know? <laughs> just like those sad romantic movies. <laughs> oh, jeez. 
I asked them, do you see, you know, my husband just left here anywhere? So oh, who is your husband? <laughs> I said, the one with bird like this, German, tall, you know, handsome. I said, oh, yeah, yeah, he just left, you know, which bus long ago? And I said, is there any other bus now? Said, no, last one, gone. It's late, say. Oh, so, because I chase him with a horse car, you know, <laughs> it takes a long time. <laughs> In India, you have horse, horse, horse car. One horse carry about ten person. And I ran the whole car. Still couldn't chase after him. He just left. Okay. I don't mind if he misunderstand him, me, you know, but he's not supposed to be. He just came first time to see me. I didn't want him to get hurt like this. I also didn't want him to see me, but since he came already, I don't want him to have just a bad souvenir to bring home. He came such a long way and we didn't see each other for a year, you know, and I don't want him to to feel so bad, yeah? Suppose he felt bad, otherwise he wouldn't have throw the camera there and go without saying one word to me and without written even a note to say why. So I didn't go there for that purpose, you know, and he misunderstood. So next day I went to the post office and tried to call him. But to call Delhi from there is like <coughs> you contact the moon or Mars, you know. <coughs> Just, hello, hello, and then whoop, cut. And before you can even say hello, you have to wait half, half a day to get the line. There's only one post office and there's a kind of, you know, old-fashioned kind of uh, co transport <laughs> uh, communication. Because the mountain is Himalaya, there's, there's no such uh, convenient, uh, you know, walkie-talkie mobile phone like we had. So I wait half a day just to say hello and then it cut. And then I wait another few hours again just to say another hello. And then the other guy don't understand anything about English. I said, get somebody to talk English. Get somebody English. I said, English, English? No, no, sorry, bang. <laughs> okay, so next, the third time, I wait another four hours to get through. And then I asked an Indian guy, you know, who spoke English in the post office. Luckily, I got one. Please tell him. I want to talk to somebody who speaks English over there and don't hang me up again. It's going to take me a whole day to, to say hello. You know, so, okay, finally, I got through the message. You know, my husband, is he still there? Because he went, I guess he went back there. I don't know where he went. But I guess he went back there because uh, the friends say he went back to, he wanted to go back to Germany. Why? He just came there. He wanted to stay there for two weeks holiday and then he came, don't meet me and then go back to Germany. So that means he's very sad, you know. So I say, oh, please go and find my husband. I say, who's your husband? We have a thousand around here with beard and with beard and <laughs> blue eyes and, you know, <laughs> blonde hair and tall and handsome. I said, no, my husband, so-and-so name, please find him. And then he said, no, no, we don't know. So I said, okay, so please uh, tell him that, you know, I call, you know, if he comes, such and such name. He said, okay, okay. But then I wasn't sure the man understands, so I might give a kind of uh, telegraph. Huh? But I didn't even know that he would receive it. I said, you misunderstood. Please come back immediately. Huh? <laughs> So, and I left it there, but I had no hope that uh, he will receive. And I waited and waited and waited. I don't see any reply. A few days later, I, I left. You know, I went to further, higher region to go to visit those, you know, like Ganges tree, where the source of the Ganges is, the Ganges River is. So I went up there, and very high mount. And I also, I also didn't say, yeah, I did say I go where, you know, but to just random people over, over in uh, around that area. Then my husband did come back, did come back. <laughs> and then, then he did ask the people there and chase after me up to the place where I was. I was in the midway only and then I stay in a hotel, you know, before I go further. At that time, in that place, you still have a hotel, if you can call that a hotel at all. But at least you have a room with four walls, you know. You know, like in a prisoner, you have a cell like that, solitary cell, yeah? And that's enough, because at least it keeps you s solitary from the mosquitoes. Yeah? <laughs> you hang your mosquito net there, between the four walls, 
on top of the nails of the that you nail on the wall, and then that's it. You just jump in from the door, and then you're in <laughs> the mosquito nest and in the four wall. And it's cheap, you know. It's not expensive. I can't afford it too much. But when I went there to ask for a room, the the person at the reg- registration desk asked me, "You can't stay alone. We have a husband." So I had to say, "Oh, my husband? Yes, I have one. He's coming soon." <laughs> Uh, he is coming in the afternoon. I just say like that, you know, at random. But really, he did come in the afternoon. <laughs> Afterward, yeah. And then, so what happened? I was on the street buying some fruit. I'm sure I told you all this story. Oh. Yeah, maybe in Chinese. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe in German. <laughs> okay, I was planning to write a book, a story of my life, and become a bestseller. <laughs> There's so many things I cannot even tell you. This is one of those stories, you know. Okay, so I was buying fruit, you know. I booked the hotel. Okay, put everything there. I locked my room and then went out buy some fruit. I was just choosing some mango, you know, and then suddenly there were two big hands behind me, cover my face like this, <laughs> and I was struggling to get free. And there was a voice, very familiar, said, "Happy birthday!" <laughs> <laughs> and I turned around, there he was, my husband. We had the same birthday. Yeah. So I said, "Okay, happy birthday to you." <laughs> and so that night he stayed with me there, and then we traveled together up there. So I didn't have to explain anymore because he know I'm alone there. <laughs> yeah, and he never asked about the guy with the camera. <laughs> <laughs> he probably knew too. When he went there already, probably the guy explained to him that uh, <laughs> he just borrowed my room. <laughs> Meanwhile, he had already a room next door, no? and then he, with his girlfriend. So probably he went there, then everything is clear. The truth always comes out. Huh? I didn't even have to say anything anymore because when he found me in the Himalaya alone like that, you know, in a small room alone, then he knows. Okay, and then he was very happy, you know, that I let him travel with him and then walk together to many different places. I show him the Himalaya that I know through the maps, <laughs> and uh, many of the legends, you know, the stories, the uh, mystic, uh, mysticism hang around concerning those places, and he was fascinated. Yeah, but he wasn't. A non-believer, you know. He was a Catholic, though, you know, until he didn't pay the church tax, and then they kick him out. <laughs> he said, "I believe in God, but I don't believe in church tax." <laughs> so the priest also did not believe in him. <laughs> so he said, "Because I don't pay church tax." I will not be able to marry you in the church. That was before, you know, before we married. I said, I don't mind. Marry anywhere. <laughs> and also, he's not uh, prayed for when he died. You know, the funeral service they don't give him. Go, he don't pay t- church tax. He couldn't attend church and all that. I said, okay, never mind. I call all my uh, Buddhist teacher come pray for you. <laughs> he said, even if I don't pay tax. For the temple, he said, "No, no, we don't have just tax system in Buddhism. We pay, we pray for free. Uh, and since you're dead anyhow, you couldn't pay anything. <laughs> It's all right." So he was very happy that the, the Buddhist monks are better. <laughs> he said, "My God, 25 percent tax is wicked. You know, I can't afford it." He said, I "Can't afford it." Uh, he was a doctor, but then he. Continue to study and research more in his subject so that he can be better doctor, you know. So uh, he had money. We we live on well, but not very famous, huh? Not very rich. It's okay, because he also was just graduate not long ago, and he has to do his t- in internet in 
internship, internship and apprenticeship, yeah, for two, three years without not much pay. And also I have to buy a house and all that, you know. So I understood. I never demand him anything. He give me what he can, yeah? And always an ask. <laughs> very generous husband, very considerate. I never complain about him, never, nothing. Except sometimes some woman patients or nurses, you know, they <laughs> they felt like they should need some protection from him sometimes, and it take long, longer than is necessary, you know. They even came to my house for protection. Then I was a little bit, you know, <laughs> angry. <laughs> Otherwise, not much. Oh, where were we? Hmm? Huh? Huh? Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Okay, fine. That's it. That's where he found me, you know. And it's funny how he found me just like that. Yeah. Always. He always find me wherever he wanted. Before that, he went all over to many post office, you know, before before the uh, Rishikesh, nah? before that, the first time. He went every... I said, how you find me in Rishikesh? He said, oh, he went to every post office, every bank, and asked whether such and such small <laughs> Asian lady come here, get money, or post letter, or blah, 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 anything like that or not. So, no, no. He traced me in every way he can, you know. Traced me into the other ashram where I just left. I left in three, four ashram, and he chased them all up to there, but then I just left. Just like in the movies, I told you. He came and I just left before that, just a few minutes or maybe last night, something like that. And then he traced to the last place where he met me, at the spring water. Nah? Okay, now, so we went together everywhere, blah, 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 like that, and came back. Later on, he had to go home, and I continue my search for spiritual wisdom <laughs> in India. At that time, I already had some, but I thought I still need some more, you know, in case, <laughs> in case, and so I continue a lot. Mm. So that was it. Mm? Well, this story just okay, okay, fine. <laughs> this story, sometimes I want to remember, just to remind me that sometimes people can be very wrongly uh, accused. Huh? or wrongly judged by just outer action, by just simply the so-called facts, but it's not the truth. Yeah. If that lousy guy just say a few words more, would have saved my husband tickets and time and agony that he had to go through for four or five days. And he still loved me at that time, you know, and he expected me to sit cross legs and somewhere, you know, like a holy person, not to run around with a guy like that, <laughs> you know, and survival up to the 24th century with him. <laughs> so I didn't want to hurt him so much, you know, he was very hurt, that's why he left immediately. Don't say even one word, don't even say goodbye, nothing. He was a gentleman, you see, he didn't want to trouble my new relationship. <laughs> Thanks a lot. I didn't need it. That lousy guy keeps saying more, you know. He, he knows he's my husband. Why he say, I, I live here, I sleep here? You know, he could have said more, okay, she lent me her room, you know, but we are not boyfriend, girlfriend. Then I would be more grateful instead of being mad at him later. And I was mad at him and he was surprised. Oh, you changed! <laughs> because I have never been mad before during all this time in the ashram or anywhere else, and everybody knows I was a smiling angel, you know. And I had no reason to be mad at anybody, except that he's too stupid to, to not to be mad at, you know. I said, you're just so stupid. And that I left, you know, and he said, Oh, you changed! <laughs> What would you say in my case? Huh? What would you say? Same. Yeah, same, huh? or maybe more, huh? <laughs> maybe say it with fingers. Huh? <laughs> I had to do that sometimes too, during my pilgrimage journey sometimes, because some guys, they are very rude. You know, in India, a woman don't walk alone, don't go out alone, don't stay alone overnight anywhere because then you will be looked down upon as a not good. 
uh, take taking advantage of all the time. So of course I have to go everywhere alone. I couldn't find anyone to go with me. My husband didn't want to come with. I didn't have any friend who has the same crazy idea that I had at that time. So how I no not go alone. Huh? So I go alone everywhere. I mean sometimes you know people come and make trouble for me. You know, okay, it's okay. Just talk, talk, and then I say, okay, I don't want it. Go away. But during my meditation, and go disturb me and touch my face and all this, you know? And so, of course, I have to give him some kind of proof that, bang, like this, <laughs> really give into his face, you know? And he's still there, and I give another one, bang. <laughs> and then he understood the language. <laughs> because the verbal language failed to convince him that I don't want to have anything to do with him. So I had to give him some kind of, you know, like, Sign language. <laughs> yeah, but I don't think it hurt him so much. It just shocked him, and then he knows. Okay, sometimes like that. You had to do that. And sometimes children, they throw stone at you if you happen to go through Muslim village or town. Because, uh, because after I have so much trouble with men, you know, I, I put on my um, monk's robe. First I thought I don't want to wear it because it's too eyes catching, you know. It's very yellow, you know. It's Tibetan, <laughs> yellow and pink. Oh no, red and all that. And sometimes Indian monk. I was ordered into two traditions: Indian and Tibetan. And I have both of the rope set, and that's all I carry with me. Besides of my two, that was after the. After I have more transportation, and one set the uh, Tibetan, one set of Indian, and one set of the white. I left one in another place. I had two before. A white like pajama, like like tunic, yeah, that I went to Himalaya with. There was only two, but after I was ordained, I have two more. So I wear them alternatively, yeah, to let people know that I'm a nun, yeah. And even if I travel alone, I he don't mess about with you, so leave me alone. But then I have another problem. <clears throat> like everybody want to come and take me home, <laughs> you know, to worship and to offer. Uh, in India, they they respect monks and nuns so much. They call them saint. Yeah, they call you Babaji, Maharaji, Mahatmachi, uh, Matachi, Achi <laughs> Chi Chi. <laughs> and they want to bring me home to feed me, clothe me, give me milk, give me bath, give me room, thing like that. Because these people are renunciate people. But I don't know, they are not always kind to other monks and nuns. It's just to me. Um, but I have to always refuse, you know. Because I don't like to <laughs> to be worshipped that way. I just go around and I'm just an ordinary person. But that's okay, also fine. And one time I went into a very big camping uh, season, camping place. Uh, that was in uh, Hariwad. Hariwad means the gate of heaven. It's one of the very big, famous, important, holy pilgrim place in India. And every twelve years, you know, they have a Kumbha Mela. A Kumbha Mela means a gathering of all the saints and seers and sages in India. It doesn't matter where the person stays, where, where the monks or the seer or the yogis, you know, the saint and the sage is the one who can see things, a future and all that, one who can see psychically all that, or the one who already attained uh, enlightenment and all that, or, attain, or one who had not attained enlightenment and all that. Sometimes they hide themselves in caves in mountain remote. But at that time of Kumbha Mela, every twelve years they would gather in that place together. And people would come in, in millions to prepare Thousands, hundreds of thousands of tens, you know, free of charge for these monks and also for the pilgrims, whoever like to overnight there. Of course, never enough. But still, they, they reserve one tent for me when I just pass by and I say, could I sleep somewhere? And they lead me to one very big tent, as big as this, uh, you know, front place quarter together for me. I was so scared because <laughs> it's too big for me. And and then later the monk and other people want to come in and sleep with me, you know. But I was so scared, I'm not used to it. They sleep so near, you know. <laughs> and sometimes they want to hug you and all that. I thought, oh, oh, 
no, <laughs> I'm ticklish, you know, cannot do that. <laughs> so I, I ran out and went to another tent. I think that monk was a little funny. I went to another tent where I sleep with more people. I feel safer. But even though that is a very full tent already, you know, very full, very full. And I sleep on edge of the tent and with all the smelling feet and, you know, kicking around and <laughs> slapping around hands all the time. And I could hardly sleep. So finally, I woke up and went out, you know. And then that monk chased after me. He said, Ah, oh, go back, go back, sleep in that big tent. I said, No, I don't want it, thank you. He said, No, you have to go back. I said, no, I don't have to. <laughs> and he said, no, you must. If you don't go back, I say, you're still in something. I said, come on. <laughs> and he still tried to force me there, you know. So I, I just pretend that I go there. And then after I see him, you know, just walk around, and I, I go from, through the back, you know, under the tent. I crawl under the tent and go through the back and then run away. <laughs> I was scared of him. <clears throat> <laughs> I even had to protect myself from monk, can you believe that? I, alone is very dangerous. So, be careful. Huh? He forced me there, so he said, I will steal something, so that you have to stay, I have to stay. Can you believe that? Maybe he just wanted to protect me, you know, because he said, it's dangerous out there to go alone, and I don't know it, but I say, it can't be more dangerous than this. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it couldn't be more dangerous. I was scared, you know, I was alone. And that man was so strong. I don't know if he's a real monk or not. <laughs> Even if he wear monk's robe, you know. Anybody can wear monk's robe in India if you want to. And if you grow a bear as well, wow, you have everything you want. Because you're holy. <laughs> People worship the monk's robe and the bear, you know. Really, I tell you, if you're fed up with America, with all the tax system and the low pay wages, you just go to India, grow a bear. Huh? A bear, right? Yeah. Makrawa? <laughs> a bird, yeah? And a mustache, yeah? As well, together. And let it grow as long as possible. And to be sure, you dye it in white. Huh? <laughs> and then you sit next to the Ganges River, just sit there, do nothing. And then in front of you, like magic, will appear fruit, milk, chapatis, yeah, curry, anything you want. And sometimes all the beautiful girls are prostrating in front of you, the holy sage. Really, if you have a bear, people think you are holy. Luckily, I didn't have one. <laughs> Even I tried to grow her, I can't. Oh, I, so I said to myself, oh, forget the sainthood, who need it? <laughs> That's true, huh? Well, it's, there's a joke, but it, it's not too far from the truth. So when you go to India, even though the climate is so hot and sticky sometimes, you wonder why all the men grow long bare, you know? Okay, that's us, by the way. Huh? Where were we? I forgot. Where were we? Huh? 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 <laughs> oh yeah, I sneak out of the tent and run away. I know where he was, so I sneak where he cannot find me. You know, I went very far away and then returned back, go back to the gate. And I tried to find a very quiet corner to meditate. And there are some, you know, a corner from the house or tent here and there, but never quiet. How can you find a quiet corner when you're in the middle of millions of people? And they talk all day, all night, and they walk all day, all night, and the dust are flying all over like cloud, 24 hours a day. And I wasn't used to it. And I begin to feel regretful to have ever set foot in this Kumbha Mela. But it was so tempting, you know. After you reach Yogananda and Himalaya Master, and you know, a thing like that, huh? the Living Master, all that, Kumbha Mela is a rare thing. Because you don't just stay there 12 years just to see one. And sometimes I forget which year is that. You know? Just happened, then that, that year happened. And I was very lucky in that year also, the Kumbha Mela, and many very rare masters that I found before they just dropped dead. Yeah, some live a very long year, uh, 200 years, 300 years, and 250 years, everything, like that, a lot. And uh, that year also, the, uh, him, the, the, the Dalai Lama also gave a very rare kind of teaching. I didn't benefit much because I didn't hear anything. <laughs> the translation was lousy, the microphone was out of the 
outdate, you know, like from the World War Three system, uh, World War Two, <laughs> World War Two museum. So you can hear all the echo. Besides, there was a couple, you know, the Western couple who happened to find I'm very attractive as a babysitter, so they throw their baby at me <laughs> all this time. And the baby plucked my nose, <laughs> fiddled my ears, you know, and uh, pulled my clothes, you know. So I was very busy buttoning all the time <laughs> and keeping away from his finger that poked into my nose at the wrong time, and I at him all the time. And he squeezed in my ears and then kissed me with his wet lips and, you know, scratched my face, every, everything, and then screaming and talked to me in all kind of language I didn't know. <clears throat> so I never had a chance to hear one word what the Dalai Lama had to say, you know, not to talk about translation or anything like that. And I could not even move because I was right in the front next to the holy people. And I'm supposed to be holy with a monk robe and that. I can't even complain. I can't even move. And the baby could just torture me for three hours long. <laughs> and I said, oh, well, my, never mind. If the other couple has enlightenment, I probably have some merit as well <laughs> as a babysitter. <laughs> <laughs> and they were so devoted and so attentive to the D D Dalai Lama that I had no heart to throw back the baby at them, you know. And they seemed to completely forget that they even have a baby. <laughs> and they forgot me and the baby all together. Because it's a rare chance that the Dalai Lama, you know, the Holy King of Tibet, gives this kind of, of uh, what, initiation. It's supposed to make you become Buddha either in four lifetimes or in sixteen lifetimes, so you can wait. No? And the initiation is, is very complicated. First, the Dalai Lama had to... Can I go on about this kind of thing? Yeah. <laughs> it would take long, you know. I can go on and on and on from one thing after another, <laughs> because it's just one of the things. <coughs> Tell me if it's too late. <laughs> okay, okay. So first of all, it's not in Delhi, okay? It's not in Bombay next to the airport or first class hotel, anything like that. It's in the middle of nowhere. It's in the mountain, very high mountain, and a barren mountain as that. It's like a desert mountain. And people there who live, those Tibet nun nuns and monks or residents, they dig caves into the mountain there and live there. But they were fabulous place. In the evening, I saw all the mountain turn into silver and gold. And all the sky would glitter, you know. And I kept telling people, my God, what a wonderful place. It's all gold and silver. And they say, where? <laughs> and I say, here, yeah, the mountain. And they say, no, the mountain is gray. It's not silver. I say, no, it's glittering. Nobody see anything the way I saw. And I thought, it's like that. I can't believe what they don't believe, you know? I can't believe because it's so obvious that the mountain is glittering, like silver and mountain and gold, and the sky is glittering with all kind of light, you know? I said, yeah, here, everywhere. And they look everywhere, but nobody see. And I was beginning to wonder whether they are crazy or I am crazy. <laughs> but I think... My craziness is nicer because it's colorful and glittering, <laughs> so it's okay. Mm. Okay, so just, uh, you know, we uh, slowly go to that. Huh? And then so uh, the Dalai Lama had to travel from uh, Dharamsala, is where his abode is, you know, he has a kind of um, uh, palace there, huh? and then very far away from that place. That place, oh, I thought that place. I forgot the name. Just now I forgot. But I know, I still can remember if I want to. No, 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 no. <laughs> oh, never mind. I will, if I write a book, I will edit in later. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> Anyhow, very far away place, huh? And the Dalai Lama is okay because he has transportation. 
the army will help him with a jeep yeah? and all that. And all his subordinates and entourage will go together with him. They went there ten days before the initiation. First, he has to purify himself by initiating himself. I don't know how that's done, but then he put some kind of flower, you know, white flower, like a band of white dry flower on top of his head like this, like you have a headband. And then it's a kind of white flower, but dry. Then he had to sit on top of kusha grass kind of uh, seat, prepare for him. And then all the monks around him in a glass house. Ten days, ten nights, they have to recite mantras, sutras, and mudras. Mudra means you do the gesture by hand like this, different gesture. Yeah, when you are reciting the the mantra and the sutra, you do the mudras together. That's all kind of complicated. And then ring the bell at the same time, yeah? And swing your body back and, you know, sideways like this. The, the, the way the Tibetans do, no? Huh? And sometimes they also put the gong and all that. It's very beautiful also, huh? Very systematic, very... Rim- what? Rhythmatic and very uh, holy kind, huh? The chanting is kind of, you know, deep and throaty tone, you know. <laughs> and then you feel, oh, you feel airy, you know, even though if you don't know what it is, but you feel impressed and airy and very <clears throat> holy indeed, you know, you feel awesome, huh? respectful. Huh? And you became also very aware of something uh, beyond yourself, beyond this ordinary life. Because the mountain and the place alone also impress you, out of the middle of nowhere. It's only mountain, 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 no, no residence. But then you see some holes in the, in the wall, in, in, the, in the mountain wall, and the nuns and monks appear there with colorful dresses, you know, and they wear beautiful hats, like the Russian one, you know. The nuns, of, oh, the nuns, they were beautiful, because they wear the hat, they cover their bald head, and they look so dignified. And the color of the dress they wear, mostly bukan color, you know, bukan, wine color. And then they drop and drop some yellow kind of uh, outfit on it, and you know, oh no, chasa, a piece of uh, well, how you call it? Help me. Look like blanket, but it's packed together a hundred pieces, you know, quilt. Yeah, and they wrap around their shoulder. Look real holy and ancient, né? And that's why I wanted to become Tibetan monk as well. <laughs> Because they just look beautiful. <laughs> I, I had some of these clothes set before. Oh, I think you saw me in the picture, huh? Okay, so now we forget about that. And then out of the middle of nowhere like that, ten thousands of people came and walked around all day making a lot of dust. <laughs> because there they don't have cement, they don't have... Uh, a uh, paved road, they don't have a uh, stone paved road, nothing, just dirt, dusty, because the mountain is also bare, because they cut whatever grass and tree they can find to <laughs> burn, to cook. So the mountain has nothing at all. When it glow like silver and gold in the night, in my eyes, huh? other people's eyes, it's also dirt and <laughs> gray, uh, nothing. They told me it's cold, it's nothing. I said, okay, okay. Fine, yeah? All right, then uh, the Dalai Lama had to do like that for ten days, purify himself yeah, and the monks together before he gave initiation for these people. So they were very, very kind of solemn kind of occasion. It's not like just a walk through initiation like here, you know, or walk in, <laughs> walk in convenient method the way we do. But we had more experience. I didn't have any experience at that time. But you're supposed to, when you dream, you know, when you go to sleep at night, they tell you how to dream, you know. You must dream of something. And if you dream of monks or kings or that, then it's supposed to be auspicious. Then you become Buddha very soon. Uh, I don't know how soon, but it's supposed to be very soon. But you just have to believe it. And if to have a, you happen to dream about devil or woman and all that, then it's no good. <laughs> yeah. 
So I was trying very hard to dream of the monks, but I haven't seen any that come to my dream. And nothing come at all. I sleep, I probably I snore. <laughs> and all the monks or the woman or devil, whatever it is, scared and run away. Mm. I meditated hard and then I slept, but nothing came. <laughs> except the silver and gold mountain and the glittering sky with light, I don't see nothing more. But I, I saw that before everything, before initiation. Actually, it was an initiation, I hear nothing. You know, I was busy, you know, with the pokey nose baby and <laughs> with his napkins and his wet, slimy lips, you know, kissing me and all that, and tried to talk to me all the time. I can't hear nothing except his baby, blah, blah. No. So I don't consider I was entitled to be a Buddha very soon, even if I saw some monks in my dream. <laughs> and, uh, okay, that was it. So a lot of people went there for initiation. Huh? A lot. Of, he has many uh, Western disciples who come all over the place to see him, especially in such occasion. And before you get there, you had to walk sometimes many ten of miles because there's no car. You have to walk through river, climb many mountains, and sometimes you happen to be lucky and you have some truck meanwhile. So you have to combine, you know, like, okay, you go by bus, and then you go by train, and then you go by hiking, and then you go by horse car, and then all the time you go by buffalo cars, and then all the time you walk through mountains, uh, climb the mountains, and then all the time you walk through tunnels, duck through the mountain, all the time you or swim through the river, and then all the time you happen to find some truck, truck, you know, truck that they uh, go around in the mountain, they, they, they want to carry rocks, and then if there's empty space behind, they let you come up one, one, uh, one rupee each person. One rupee is maybe about half of a cent in American money, yeah. Over there it's different, huh? Yeah, very cheap, okay? <laughs> But the trucks are very dangerous place to be on. Because there's no roof, nothing. And the truck is high, and the mountain road is very tricky. There are a lot of rocks that is uh, hanging from the mountain on top of your head. So you have to watch out. Because if you stand up or you sit on the truck and your head a little bit above the roof, then the rock will hit you. So you always sit, hit, and bow, stand, you know, so your head always have a chance to exercise. <laughs> Either turn left, turn right, turn to the front or turn backward. It's up to you, up to the situation. But you have to be fast or the, mount, the mountain rock will send your head somewhere else and then send your body to the Dalai Lama properly. So very dangerous, but better than nothing. And then that, not to mention the, the way the truck drive, you know, because the mountain road is very windy, windy like this, and then sometimes it's very um, stiff, you know, and the, the, the road is not paved, and you walk just, you, you stay on that just like you are uh, 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 riding on a horse, you know, it galapa, 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 galapa like this. <laughs> and sometimes you have to stop because landslide. The, the the rock and the sand will run all over on your plate on on your head and then you have to stand up for your right <laughs> and shake all the sand and you know get all the stone from your ears and then run and then wait until the landslide over or it never over and then you have to run back again find another road and then run through another mountain it's longer distance and then walk again sometimes people die the whole bus is or the whole truck, because landslide come with a warning. The whole mountain seems just like sliding down upon you and then send you ship rocketing to the pit under there, which is about sometimes many, many miles deep. You don't see the bottom. So you never see the bus again. So very dangerous, yeah? But it was exciting. I was young and stupid, so <laughs> nothing really scares me. But everything scares me now. Everything. When you get old, you don't have courage anymore. <laughs> now if you pay me two million US dollars, ask me to go back do the same journey again, I say, no, keep yours. <laughs> really, it was very, very oh, challenging, you know. 
And then sometimes you walk through because you can't bring too many things with you, and you have uh, your luggage like a sleeping bag and some clothes. Then you have to put it on your head with the plastic bag. You have to protect your clothes because if you wet this one that you wear and you don't have another one to uh, to change immediately after you came out of the icy river, then you can become one with the river again. You know, you cold, you stiff, and then they throw you in the river, <laughs> and then you become one. So that's the problem. See, you have to protect your your clothes. You put it on your head, or even when you swim, you have to put it on your neck. You know, with the plastic bag and on your back, so you don't get it wet. At least you must have one pair of dry clothes to change immediately after you swim in the river, or walk through the river even. You see. So it's not that easy. The way I try to find the truth is hard way. But it was okay with me. Whatever would I do at that time? I had nothing else to do except to find the truth that I want to seek. See? Mm. So anyhow, finally we arrived. Huh? And it was such a beautiful and romantic place, I told you. And then we stayed there for maybe two weeks. Huh? until the initiation over, <coughs> and still can stay on for a while. And I told you already, the Dalai Lama was always very kind to me, huh? especially, I don't know why. Every time I see me, he spotted me on, in the crowd. He said, ah, hello, come here. <laughs> and then he always gave me some of the precious medicine that he made himself. This medicine is specially Tibetan. I probably told you already. It's made of 72 different kind of precious stones and rare medical substance. It uh, maybe hundred over hundred substance together in one little tiny pill like this, and it's you know it comprises of a lot of precious stones, even like lapis lapis lazuli and all that kind of thing in powder and all kind of very rare Tibetan mountain medicine plant herbs that combine together and it's supposed to combat all kind of disease make you live long life and all kind of uh, negative power will be defeated a small pill like this but very expensive even his brother <laughs> the Dalai Lama brother had to buy it himself enough for free and he couldn't afford it he buy it maybe he can buy three at a time only but the Dalai Lama give me a handful all the time but I had to tell you, there is some animal substance in it, so I never took any. But it's no problem, it's not waste. I can just distribute it to his hunger disciple, and they all worship me like king. <laughs> <laughs> because they don't have any. I saw that I was the only one that he ever gave personally medicine like this. Every time he saw me, he gave me medicine. Yeah. He probably think I need it. <laughs> I probably look so bad. Yeah, I had some kind of scratch sometime because of climbing the mountain, and I have sometime insect bite, mosquito sometime, you know. Or probably I didn't look so. Then I didn't look so smooth. Then I didn't put any cream on my face, no makeup or nothing. And sometime I climb the mountain and I don't take care, you know. So sunburn and all that, the peeling and a scratch from the trees and and kind of uh, thorny bushes, you know, bushes from my arms and faces and all that. So he probably think I desperately need some care. He was just a very kind person. I don't know whether he's holy or not, we don't talk, but he was a very good human being, very gentle, very kind. That's why a lot of people like him, even though they are not his disciple, you know, Tibetan Buddhist, nothing. And that's why many people became Buddhist <laughs> also, huh? And uh, recite mantras and run around with the circumambulate with this, uh, I say, I don't know. They have a kind of uh, Dharma wheel, they call it. Every Tibetan have one. They always go around running either with the uh, the beats, prayer beats, all with a right, uh, prayer wheel, you know. They turn around 24 hours. They say they're turning it because it's just like the rhythm of the universe, like the earth also turning, you know. So turning the wheel of the Dharma. <laughs> There's a sim symbolic 
uh, of the will of the Dharma, the teaching. Uh? So everybody go around with that all the time. And some Western people, when they convert it into Buddhism, they also buy one. And everybody have a bowl like this so you can drink tea. Everywhere you go as a monk, you must have a wooden bowl like that. So, because everywhere you go, people will offer tea and eat, and you put it in the bowl. Uh, but um, I don't eat them. There's food because it's always non-vegetarian. Except when you became a monk, the day you have, sh- your sh- day you shave your head with your master, that's the day all the master and disciple eat vegetarian. They also know vegetarian, but they don't eat it all the time. Just at that day. Yeah. Well, they're used to it. In Tibetan, they say they're used to it eating meat. Huh? But some of the Tibetan monks are vegetarian by occupation. For example, the oracle monk, he must, as a rule, be a vegetarian at all times. The oracle monk is the one, is a monk who has to predict the future and some kind of event by psychic power for the, you know, for the interest of uh, the public. Eh? Sometimes the Dalai Lama consulted them for some uh, event. Sometimes uh, they have to predict the future of the nation or what the outcome of a very strange event, you know, like predict the future and all that, huh? like horoscope reading, but uh, on a larger scale. And some other monks, uh, they have like the weather forecast man, <laughs> monk, like because he he had to make the weather nice whenever Dalai Lama or some high Lama have to give lecture, because they don't have a big place, so they give lecture in the open air, and a lot of people come like that. Then they have to make sure that during this one week or two weeks, the weather is tip top condition every day, no raining allowed. So these these are different kind of monks, you know. This weather monks he has to sit in meditation all day, all night, and control the weather. <clears throat> Send all the rain, the hurricane, the typhoon back to Taiwan or somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> I had also the honor to study with some of them. And I probably was too stupid, and I told it to some of the my disciples, and that's how it came the story of making rain in San Jose last time, and that's how some people scolded me for boasting. Remember? Yeah, remember the story? Okay, I didn't really boast. I didn't even make rain anymore. I just uh, tell him that, okay, I go and find some rain gods where he drink wine and get drunk and sleep somewhere. I just spank them and make them get up and make rain for you. Uh, I made joke with the the man who tried to sell me the place in San Jose. And he believed in me. And that's why it rains. Maybe he believed was so strong. And after I come back to San Jose again later, and he showed me the leg that he asked me to... My grain there before, he said, this is lake where the San Jose people, some of them drink, you know, and it's all empty. Can you make rain because your disciples say you can do anything? I said, no, I'm not sure if I can, but I can find the rain god, you know, probably he get drunk somewhere. <laughs> I just <laughs> scold him and send him back to work for you. Maybe it works. And I just said, maybe, huh? Then it really worked, you know. Immediately afterward, the rain fall, and then there were half of the lake full. So when he came back, I came back to San Jose again, he showed me my the place that I should buy, every paper ready to sign, and he showed me, Only half, please fill another half too. <laughs> I said, well, I don't know about that, let's see. But immediately it rained again later, and the whole leg full again. Remember last time? <laughs> it was the first time I came to San Jose, and, and it was maybe first or second time, and it has been... Uh, dry for six years, remember? And many cows dies, many animals dies, many farmers dies, many orchards dies. Huh? Die because no water. Orange and all that became very expensive at the time. Huh? A lot of farmers bankrupt and many cows die. So that was the famous thing that my disciple made trouble for me. Yeah? 
because one of our our brother brother but sister told the one the agency that wanted to sell the land for me that oh my master she can do anything <laughs> so the only thing that person won for me at that time was rain because I don't have water there so he bring me to but it happened that the mountain I bought is next to the lake also and the lake normally have to be full for the resident around there to use but it was all empty until the last drop already you can see the whole lake dry so he said please feel it <laughs> your, I said how oh, what he said, he said your disciple tell me you can do anything anything so this is nothing to you right <laughs> okay anyhow I just study a lot of things but I don't use them anymore because there's no need you can make rain that's for sure that's no problem you can stop the wind yeah, if you know how these are just, just if you can uh, dig deep into the secret formula of the universe. And this kind of science, it's like science, you know? It's just like before we don't have wireless uh, telephone, we don't have cordless mobile phone, now we do. If suppose uh, 200 years ago, if you talk to some people long distance in a box like that, and the other one receive you a voice just like next, next door, in another box like this, you know, black and small in your hand, people would think you're a magician, right? But now it's ordinary. So some science about the universe have been lost to our knowledge, and we uh, think it's superstition or impossible. Nothing is impossible. Even flying through the air, or live a few hundred years, or a thousand years, Nothing is impossible. But what for do you want to? Did I tell you the story about the long, long-lived lake water? <clears throat> no, not even that. No. Jesus Christ, what, <laughs> what didn't I all tell you, huh? <laughs> okay. Supposedly there was one lake in India, very deep, high in the Himalaya, with the elixir water that and it has the ability to grant you long, long, long life. Okay? So, Alessandra the Great, the one who conquered nearly the whole earth before, remember? Also want to have that kind of elixir water so he can live long. Because there are a few more countries he didn't conquer yet. <laughs> and he was getting old. Hmm? <clears throat> so he went to the lake. Uh, it's very difficult to find that lake, you know, because not many people know. But then because of his power, you know, he has a lot of spies and FBI, CIA agency, <laughs> has been able to find it for him. So finally, he was there in front of the lake, and he was about to drink it. And then suddenly there come a very husky voice and said, Your Majesty, don't drink it. No, no, actually, he didn't say like this. He said like this. You must be a spirit. Don't drink. <laughs> he, he throw himself at the feet of the emperor. Oh, no, he throw himself at the feet of the emperor. <laughs> I said, please, your majesty. Don't drink the water. It's dangerous. And the emperor, you know, Alexand Alexander the Great said, Why? How can it be dangerous to me? Because the elixir will give me long life, and I will conquer the whole world, and I will conquer the moon, the sun, and the whole universe if I live long. What's the problem with you? Why you are uh, obstruct me with drinking this water? And the old man said, Look at me. I found the water many hundred years ago. What will become of me now? You can see for yourself.
I cannot die. And I can't wait like this. The reason why I live on because I just want to keep this water. I want to stop anybody who come here and drink it. So, <laughs> I'll send out the great God the message. <laughs> I was supposed to be a, a legion, you know, I don't know if it's true or not, I wasn't there. <laughs> uh, obviously, Alexander the Great, Emperor, did not drink it because he died, right? <laughs> oh, where were we? <laughs> before the lake, where were we? Huh? Where were we before the lake? Huh? San Jose. San Jose. What oh, that was too old fashioned. All right. Okay. 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 I remember now. Okay. The monks, the Tibetan monks, with different magical power. Mm. Okay. So anyhow, <clears throat> so you know already, huh? About the rain monks and the, <laughs> huh? Rain monks and the oracle, huh? The oracle monks are supposed to be vegetarian. I'm just telling you. That's all. Okay. Otherwise, uh, most of other monks are non-vegetarian, except the day they shave their head or their disciples shave their head to become monk. And so I never ate those food that offered by them. I just drink tea. The tea is very peculiar. And uh, even though it sounds good and nutritious, it's like you have butter, and they put a butter in the hot tea. See, so they call it butter tea. Even though it's very good for the cold climate, you know, like Himalaya, but it has a very strong, peculiar taste, and you have to be used to it. Or you have to be dead thirsty. And then don't smell nothing anymore, just drink it. <laughs> but you get used to it. It's quite tasty. It's just that you would probably never drink this kind of tea in your whole life if you don't meet Tibetan people. Because it's salty and uh, buttery. <laughs> it's not the ordinary tea that we drink, either plain or sugar, not nah? sweetened. This one is made with butter and salt, so it's very salty. It's good for them. Mm? Because salt in such a region is like gold, you know that? So in Vietnam, when I was young, I know people used to trace, trade, you know, some, some of the precious things from the mountain and the people with salt. Because the mountain people, they need salt so much. Because it's so hot, so high there, and if they don't have salt, they dehydrate somehow, you know. So they need it a lot. So the plain people in the city used to cheat them, you know. Bring them salt, but take silver and precious stone and all kind of horns, you know. And uh, uh, like um, or elephant tusk, tiger skin, anything from them they give. If you just make so too valuable to them that they have to beg you for it. Because the mountain folks are very innocent people, very pure, and they're dying for salt. You know? Salt, huh? It's A-L-T. Ah, so sometimes they're cheated a lot by the people from the city. <coughs> oh, God, where I'm going? <laughs> <laughs> from Tibet to Vietnam. From tea to elephant tusk. <laughs> what else should I tell you? <laughs> <laughs>